All right, we begin segment C with the photoelectric effect. <clears throat> the um, phenomena that we have investigated so far point in the direction of light or electromagnetic radiation existing in the form of waves. The photoelectric effect is interesting because it was really the first, um, the first phenomenon that was um, observed that really pointed in the direction of light existing as a, a particle, unlike, you know, instead of a wave. Because uh, the previous things we've seen, like interference patterns, those shouldn't happen if light is a particle. On the other hand, the photoelectric effect, effect should not happen, or at least it shouldn't happen the way it does if light is a wave. So which is it? a wave or a particle. Well, that's how we ended up with wave-particle duality, because it's both. <clears throat> um, the photoelectric effect is seen when a light of a sufficient energy or electromagnetic radiation of a sufficient energy is shown upon the surface of certain substances. Those substances can be caused to emit electrons. So some uh, materials can be induced to emit electrons when electromagnetic radiation of certain wavelengths or energies is shown upon them. If the, that, and that happens if the electromagnetic radiation has an energy greater than some threshold energy. So for each given substance, there's a certain minimum energy that the electromagnetic radiation has to have in order to cause the substance to release electrons. If the energy of the electromagnetic radiation is lower than that threshold energy, then nothing will happen. But if it's at that energy or higher, then the substance will start emitting electrons. And that's known as the photoelectric effect. And in fact, it's the photoelectric effect that allows us to have things like solar powered calculators or solar cells in general. Uh, they're based on the photoelectric effect. And um, this threshold, uh, the threshold energy, though, the minimum amount of energy required uh, for electromagnetic radiation to produce electrons from a substance actually changes from one substance to another. So each substance has its own characteristic value for threshold energy. For some things like cesium and francium, uh, metals basically they'll throw electrons at you just for looking at them. Uh, so the threshold energies for things like cesium and francium are very low. But on the other hand, you have um, substances like, say, um, well, I don't know, iron which would have actually a pretty high value. You'd have to um, shine probably X-rays or maybe even gamma rays on uh, iron in order to get iron to release electrons. So it can vary quite a bit from one substance to another. The kinetic energy of the electrons being ejected, you know, because once the electrons are ejected, they move with a certain speed and electrons definitely have mass. So one half of, um, the mass of the electron times the velocity of the electron squared, that's the kinetic energy of the electron that's being ejected. And it was found that that has no relation to the intensity of the electromagnetic radiation that's causing the emission of the electron. Or in other words, the brightness of the light if it's visible light. <clears throat> the kinetic energy of the electrons being released does, however, increase with increasing energy or frequency of the electromagnetic radiation or the light that's shining on the substance. And this leads to the conclusion that the electrons in a given substance, usually metals, but not always, uh, have certain binding energies. That is a certain amount of energy that's binding the electron to the atom. And in order to uh, get the electron to be ejected from the atom, you have to basically match that binding energy. You have to put in energy that's equivalent to the binding energy. And so the binding energy of the electron is actually equal to the threshold energy, that is the minimum energy required for electromagnetic radiation to cause electrons to be emitted by the substance. Okay, And this leads us to the equation uh, for finding the kinetic energy of the electrons emitted, and that is uh, let me write that a little more neatly off to the side here. Mm -hmm. 
That is the kinetic energy of the electron will be equal to the energy of the electromagnetic radiation minus the binding energy. So that's what I've written over here. It got a little garbled up there. So the, the energy of the electromagnetic radiation minus the binding energy. That'll give you the kinetic energy of the electron. <clears throat> so obviously the bigger the energy of the electromagnetic radiation is, the more kinetic energy the electron will have for, you know, for a given substance uh, and a given binding energy. Problem is classical wave theory said that the energy of the wave depended on the in, uh, intensity, not the frequency. And obviously that's not true. But uh, it, actually it is true that the number of electrons ejected in a given time, like number of electrons per second, does depend on the intensity or the amplitude of the electromagnetic radiation, as long as the energy of the, the electromagnetic radiation is greater than the threshold energy, of course. Because if it's not greater than the threshold energy, then nothing is going to happen. <clears throat> Einstein came along uh, about 1905 and started investigating the photoelectron effect. And he ended up explaining it via quantized energy. Uh, th in this case, it's the quantized energy of the waves of the electromagnetic radiation that hit the surface of the substance that you're trying to emit electrons from. So light hitting the surface is actually better viewed as a stream of particles, according to Einstein, rather than a wave. And again, because the photoelectric effect shouldn't happen the way it does if light existed as waves. And so Einstein came up with the, uh, the idea of the photon, although I don't think that he's the one who named it. Um, it turned out that, well, and photon itself uh, comes from the Greek word for light. The photo part comes from the Greek word for light, like photography, uh, which literally means writing and light. And the ons part, or the tons part, it's kind of a portmanteau where you got photo and trons as like electrons and neutrons and things like that. So photons was the particle associated with light. Um, anyway, uh, the energy of the photon depends on the frequency and the wavelength of the electromagnetic radiation, which is interesting, again, because here he is postulating that light exists as a stream of particles, or in other words, photons, but yet the energy of the photon is equal to um, Planck's constant times the frequency or Planck's constant times the speed of light over the wavelength. And frequency and wavelength are things that waves have. So obviously, by the time of Einstein, it was realized that light must have properties of both waves and particles at the same time. So the energy of an individual photon of electromagnetic radiation will be equal to h nu, that is Planck's constant times the frequency or hc over lambda. That is um, Planck's constant times the speed of light over the wavelength, because c over lambda is nu, if you remember the equation that we saw a little while ago. <clears throat> the intensity of a light depends on the number of photons or the amplitude of the wave. That, that basically ends up being the same thing in, in effect. Um, so uh, the number of photons hitting the surface in this case, not the amplitude. Okay. So when you look at when you look at light as a wave, the intensity would be governed by the amplitude. But we're looking at light in the case of the photoelectric effect as particles, and so amplitude would or would be or rather intensity would be term, determined by number of photons rather than amplitude because that's something waves have. And we're focusing on the particle properties of light in this case. <clears throat> OK, so the conclusion here is that some particles or some properties of electromagnetic radiation can only be explained by electromagnetic radiation being a wave. And other properties can only be explained by electromagnetic radiation being a particle. And that's where wave-particle duality comes from. Basically, it has to be both at the same time. 
And that's something that's kind of difficult to get your mind around because that's quantum mechanics. And like I said, quantum mechanics gets really weird really fast. And this is just one example of the kind of weird stuff that can happen in quantum mechanics. <clears throat> so we'll try not to go too deeply into it, but we do have to do some just to get the basics of things like um, the structure of the atom and how the electrons are arranged. So we'll be seeing more of that as time goes on, but hopefully not too much more. Some examples of some calculations now, um, calculating the electron or the energy, sorry, of a photon for electromagnetic radiation. Uh, obviously, if you have the wavelength or the frequency, you can calculate the energy of a photon. And so the first question is microwaves in an oven. In, uh, actually, the way microwave oven uh, works is that microwaves have just the right amount of energy to affect the rotation of certain molecules like water. And, you know, we've we mentioned before that um, molecules or particles that exist anywhere in any situation have essentially three kinds of kinetic energy. There's vibrational energy where the molecules can vibrate in place or they can even vibrate while they're moving. And there's also rotational energy, so things spinning. And then there's also translational energy, things moving from one place to another. In the case of microwaves, they tend to excite, that is increase the energy of rotation for certain molecules. And as it turns out, water is one of those molecules. And that's how it heats up food, because food contains moisture. And microwaves will increase the rotational energy of the water molecules, which has the effect of heating up the food. Microwaves work better on some foods than others, because some foods have different amounts of water in them than others. And also microwaves tend not to heat up plates, uh, except to the extent that the plate gets hot because of the food that's on it, uh, because plates generally don't contain water. Whether it's a plastic plate or a ceramic plate, doesn't include H2O, so it doesn't actually get hot, except again for heat that might be transferred from the food. <clears throat> um, and so that's how microwaves work. Anyway, the question was, uh, the frequency of these microwaves is about three times 10 to the ninth hertz. What is the energy of each photon of that microwave radiation? So again, the energy of one photon, that's a pH for photon, uh, equals H nu. It's H nu because we have the frequency, which is nu. So Planck's constant, 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 joules times seconds times nu, which is three times 10 to the ninth inverse seconds, or hertz, in other words. Uh, you'll notice that seconds in joules seconds and seconds to the minus one cancel out. And you end up with joules as the unit. That's good because we're looking for an energy. And the number is 1.99 times 10 to the minus 24 joules. That's 10 to the minus 24. Okay, so that's not a lot of energy. A joule itself is a pretty small amount of energy. And this is two times 10 to the minus 24 joules. So that's a really small amount of energy. But on the other hand, that's only one photon and photons are so tiny that they're considered to have no mass. So it's a very small amount of energy in a very tiny particle. So relatively speaking, that's actually quite a bit of energy considering how small the particle is. Um, on the other hand, what if you have the wavelength? The, um, we'll get into this a little bit more as, as time goes on in this chapter, but um, the, basically the, the most common types of street light are the uh, mercury vapor street lights, which are the white ones, and the uh, sodium vapor street lights, which are the yellow ones. They've actually started putting up LED street lights, which are the ones with all the little tiny speckly bulbs. But um, for the big glass bulb street lights, you got the mercury vapor, which are the white ones, and the sodium vapor, which are the yellow ones. So for the sodium vapor street lights, they put out one particular wavelength of light, which happens to be that orangey yellow color at um, a wavelength of 589 nanometers. And so you might wonder, what would be the energy of each photon of light from those streetlights? 
So we can figure that out easily enough if we have the wavelength. The um, uh, E photon would be HC over lambda in this case, because lambda is what we have. So H, again, is Planck's constant, 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 joule seconds. C is the speed of light, 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. And uh, lambda is the wavelength, which is 589 nanometers. But again, since nano means 10 to the minus 9, I would just write this as 589 times 10 to the minus 9 meters instead of uh, changing it to proper scientific notation. Uh, because this will work just as well, and it's not your final answer, so the, you know it doesn't have to be in proper scientific notation unless it's the final answer. So if you work all that out, you'll notice that um, seconds cancel with seconds, and meters cancel with meters, leaving you with joules for the only unit in the answer, and that's good because that's an energy unit. And the number ends up being 3.37 times 10 to the minus 19 joules per photon. Again, pretty small energy, although not as small as it was up here in the last example, but it's still pretty small. But on the other hand, at any given moment, you've got a whole lot of photons coming out of that light. So the total amount of energy coming out of the light is actually fairly substantial. And you can find that just by taking, you know, if you knew the number of photons, you could just take the number of photons coming out of the light within a given period of time and multiply it by this number here. And like I said, the number of photons would probably be really large. So uh, if you calculated this energy, you know, it might come into the range of several joules over a period of even like a second. <clears throat> um, all right. So and uh, talking about threshold energy, uh, if you have aluminum and the lowest frequency, in other words, the lowest energy photon for which the photoelectric effect actually works for aluminum is 9.87 times 10 to the 14th hertz. That is the energy that corresponds to this frequency would be the threshold energy because this is the minimum um, wave or the minimum frequency, in other words, the minimum energy for which the photoelectron works, uh, then what is the threshold energy? And the threshold energy is just the energy of the lowest energy photon capable of ejecting an electron. Well, we've got the wavelength for the lowest energy photon capable of ejecting an electron. So all we have to do is convert that frequency into energy. And energy is h nu. And that's going to be 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 joule seconds times nu, which is um, 9.87 times 10 to the 14th hertz, as it was given in the question. And that gives us an energy of 6.54 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. And that is joules per photon, although we usually just write it as joules. They're looking here for the threshold energy in kilojoules per mole of electrons. OK, so first I'm going to change this to kilojoules per photon. So 6.54 times 10 to the minus 19 joules per photon would be the same. Uh, again, if you want to go to kilojoules, the unit's getting bigger, so the number should get smaller. So you divide the number by 1,000. 6.54 times 10 to the minus 22 kilojoules per photon. And now, if we want kilojoules per mole, we have to find out basically how many moles is one photon. So again, you take the number of photons, and or the number of photons you actually have, and divide by the number of items in a mole. So uh, one photon times the fact that there's one mole for every 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd photons would be just basically 1 divided by 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd, which is 1.66 times 10 to the minus 24th of a mole. So now the uh, energy of the photon in kilojoules per mole would be the energy in kilojoules per photon, time, or, um, sorry, basically times the number of moles. 
Okay, so and that leads you to 394 kilojoules per mole. All right, a couple more minutes. I'll start at least start into line spectra. <clears throat> Essentially, the idea of a line spectrum is that for for many substances, they don't actually give off a continuous rainbow of colors. Uh, gener generally speaking, the only time you see the continuous rainbow of colors is when something is giving off electromagnetic radiation as a result of being hot, like black body radiation. When an object is heated or otherwise has extra energy added to it, the result is often an emission of light. But in most cases, you don't get a continuous rainbow of light. You'll get only certain individual wavelengths or certain individual colors of light. And there will be like nothing between those individual wavelengths or individual colors. And that's known as a line spectrum because it consists of lines of various colors with nothing in between them. <clears throat> An example of something that works like this would be neon signs, uh, fluorescent lights, sodium vapor street lights, or mercury vapor street lights for that matter. They all work on this principle where you add some energy to a substance through electricity in these cases, and the substance enters a higher energy condition than it's normally found in, which is unstable. And then it drops back down to a lower energy position, which is more stable. And when it goes from the higher energy position to the lower energy position, it gives off energy in the form of electromagnetic radiation in this case. <clears throat> but as it turns out, only certain energies are allowed for a given substance like say sodium in a sodium vapor streetlight. Only certain energies are allowed. So you can pump up the, elect the energy of sodium atoms by a certain amount that's allowed. And that energy can drop back to where it was. And so that's an amount of energy that can be released. And you can pump up the, electron or the energy of the sodium to a certain other level and then it could drop back maybe to the second level or to the first level where it began. And those are energies that can be released. But energies between those levels are not allowed. And so you only get certain wavelengths of light or only certain colors out when the atom uh, basically drops down to a lower energy level and releases electromagnetic radiation. You don't get a continuous spectrum. Okay, so, and this is unlike black body radiation. Each substance has its own characteristic wavelengths of light that are emitted because for each different substance has different levels of energy that are allowed and all other energies would be not allowed. And so for each substance, you'll get a different combination of specific energies that are being released. And actually the, that can be used to identify a substance. If you can find the wavelengths that are being released, you can often match it up to the known line spectrum of a substance and actually figure out what it is. <coughs> um, and basically, in order to get the line spectrum, you have to take the light that's being emitted from the atoms and put it through either a prism or a grating, uh, something that will separate the light into its constituent colors, basically like um, sort of like the way rain droplets in the air will um, separate sunlight into a rainbow. Uh, a prism or a grating in a scientific instrument will produce the same effect. And then you can find the individual wavelengths of light that are actually being emitted by the substance. And figure 613 um, actually shows some line spectra of various substances. And you can see how each one has a unique line spectrum that doesn't look quite like the spectra from anything else. And so if you have an unknown substance, you can actually match it up with its line spectrum and find out what it is. <clears throat> uh, the lights, the, basically the light emitted has discrete energies is another way of putting it. Only certain wavelengths or certain energies of light can be emitted. Well, that's another way of saying discrete energies. In other words, separate distinct energies 
and not a continuous variance. Uh, an example would be, say, when an electric current is passed through hydrogen gas at low pressures, the, first of all, the hydrogen molecules will break up into hydrogen atoms, and the hydrogen atoms will be raised up in energy. And from that point, they can come back down to a lower level of energy. They may drop back all the way down to where they started, or they may drop down to some intermediate level. But again, for hydrogen, only certain energies are allowed. And so you get um, some hydrogen atoms are raised way up, and then their energies will come down a little bit, and they emit electromagnetic radiation. And another uh, hydrogen atom might be raised way up, and it comes down quite a bit to another level that's allowed, and it releases a different amount of electromagnetic radiation, and so on. And in any given sample of hydrogen, you know, inside like a, a glass tube or something like in a neon sign, if you're using hydrogen, you're going to have a lot of hydrogen atoms in there. And so you're going to have basically all of the possible transitions in terms of, you know, uh, falling from a higher energy to a lower energy. You're basically going to have all of them going on at the same time constantly. <clears throat> and um, basically each wavelength of light emitted ends up being a separate line in the line spectrum. Once you put that light through the prism, you'll get a separate line for each wavelength of light that's being emitted. And in hydrogen, uh, well, one way you can look at is figure 6.13 on page 295 or 305. Uh, the light from the hydrogen um, gas um, emission light looks to us with the naked eye as a sort of a pale pink color. But when you put it through a prism, you'll find out that that pale pink color that our brain comes up with is just sort of the average color that our brain comes up with when it sees the four individual colors that actually exist in the visible range. So one wavelength would be about 410 nanometers, and that would be violet. And another one would be 434 nanometers. That would be kind of a violet blue color. And another would be at 486 nanometers. That's sort of a greenish blue or bluish green, depending on how you look at it. And then there's another at 656 nanometers, which is kind of an orangey red. So you have those four individual lines because there are four energy transitions from higher to lower energy states that are allowed for hydrogen within the visible range. There are also transitions from higher to lower energies that will have um, basically energies of electromagnetic radiation that are higher than those that fall in the visible range. So there are some transitions for hydrogen that occur in the ultraviolet range. And there are also some that have lower energies than these, and they occur in the infrared range. So there are other transitions going on that we can't see. <clears throat> Classical wave theory, anyway, said that only a continuous spectrum should be seen from something like this, not a line spectrum. And so again, we've got, uh, we have to um, sort of revise our old theories. Now I'm going to stop here for today at uh, Johann Balmer, and we'll get to him next time. Uh, so um, I will post the homework problems for chapter six very soon, if I haven't already by the time you see this. And so um, I'll see you next time.